This week, we introduced Evan to a new hair product, and then we made him watch There's Something About Mary. Welcome back to How Did You Miss This, a show where we watch, uh, I guess, important films that uh, some of us missed the first time around. I'm Evan Toller Hickey. With me, as always, Michael Hansen and Krista Shane. And today we're going to be discussing 1998's massive comedy blockbuster juggernaut there is something about mary this was one of the highest grossing if not the highest grossing comedy of the late 90s uh it really sort of uh, solidified Cameron Diaz as the 90s it girl. It launched Ben Stiller into a leading man role. Uh, am I the only person who uh, who missed this movie? Yes. Yes, it was all you. Uh, I, I, I saw this movie a bunch um, around the time that it came out and shortly thereafter. I was a um, I was a big fan of this movie in the late 90s and early 2000s uh but i i haven't seen it in quite a while so i was going to be very interested to see what what you thought about it after um you know not having ever seen it which seems somehow amazing considering it was like you were saying such a big success and one of the biggest comedies out there yeah this is another one for me that i watched exactly once and I, we i think we rented it uh, when it first came out so i have a very specific view of it in terms of my recollection and coming back to to revisit it, I'm I'm gonna throw out all of my original things and and have a, a very different perspective of it now. So this is gonna be a great one to talk about. Yeah, I am really interested in talking about this movie that you made me watch, Chris. Um, but uh, first, I mean, let's talk a little bit about how this movie came to be. So this was shot in Miami, pretty much uh, $23 million budget. This goes on to make like Three hundred and sixty-nine, three hundred and seventy million dollars at the global box office that year. This is, I mean, that's a crazy return on investment. This was an, an out and out blockbuster comedy, and uh, and I, I feel like it was one of those comedies that really solidified that idea of like um, uh, that genre of gross out comedy. That we saw a lot of in the late '90s with this movie, the American Pie movies, um, you know, even to some extent, like the South Park movie, I, I would put in that category as well. Um, and it, opening up in some really uh, uh, auspicious company. I mean, it, it opens in mid July 1998, around the same time as uh, Lethal Weapon 4, uh, Mask of Zorro, uh, but really like the the big movie coming out that summer, um, Saving Private Ryan. I think I saw all three of those movies in theaters, and yet completely completely missed this one yeah i mean I, I i think this is one of those um movies that i felt like everybody i had seen or knew had seen and and i think it partly builds off of too that this is the the fairly brothers coming off of uh kingpin and dumb and dumber which was uh another big success for for them and kind of you know moving them up to the next level which was uh this movie and and they've done a lot of um self production to get their their movies going um this this was really a big stepping stone for them getting a little bit more um well known people kind of actively willing to participate in their movies somebody like Cameron Diaz who was coming off uh, my best friend's wedding in 97 um like you know to your point she was already uh there or about to become the 90s it girl uh and this this movie was um i mean to your point it's it's part of the 90s gross out comedies but i also think this is some of the uh predecessor work that became kind of like what judd apatow and his crew uh was getting into by the you know early to mid 2000s with you know 40 year old virgin and uh you know kind of building off of there i feel like maybe um this is one of those stepping stones and, you know, then the torch gets passed a few years later after the Fairley brothers do some less successful movies like, um, 
uh, what is it? Me and Irene or whatever it is, like a couple of those other ones that people haven't seen as much and aren't as well appreciated. So this is probably the pinnacle of uh, their you know, comedic run through the mid to late nineties. Um, and then they kind of disappear off the scene for quite a while after that. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how it goes, but I think the interesting part is uh, to your point, Evan, this is not just a, a blockbuster success. Uh, I mean, to your, you were kind of saying earlier, this is one of the top uh, 20 or 25 uh, grossing comedies of all time, but the, the reception when it came out was like, Huge, like amazingly well received movie. Uh, everybody kind of recognizes that it is, um, you know, pushing the the per- political correctness buttons in all the wrong places, but just in the right ways at the time. Uh, a lot of uh, strong reception from re- reviewers and showing up on you know top movies of the year uh, kind of lists across the board has a Rotten Tomato score of eighty four percent. Uh, still. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, maybe we'll start with Michael. How, Michael, how do you feel revisiting this movie? So I, I think this movie is an excellent example of something that was super important in pushing a genre forward, but it's not good by today's standards. So I, I was amazed to see how differently I felt about it. I remember it being exactly the words that you described. Um, super well received it was just it was new in every important way and i just loved it at the time now that i watched it i had a really hard time going through the entire thing partly because there's uh, so much stuff that doesn't age well in terms of political correctness and and norms but secondly also it's interesting the apatow reference i think that the people who came after and started to take this in different directions they also had a real cleverness to it like there's a intelligence built into it combined with this that i think the, where it's gone since, but it wouldn't have happened without this movie necessarily. So from that perspective, like I can, I can appreciate it for that. It was just, I, I got very few uh, moments of enjoyment watching this when I have to, I have to be honest. How about you, Evan? How was it uh, as a first time viewer? I did not care for this movie at all. <laughs> I, 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 this movie made me sad and angry. I I did. Is this a comedy? This is. Oh, my God. Um, did I like this movie? No, not one bit. Um, and I, I think that to Michael's point, it is a really interesting. Uh, it's really interesting to watch comedy um, from the past because comedy in particular um you know, requires uh, surprise and, um, you know, pushing at those things that that um, are, are a little bit, you know, taboo to to make people laugh. And this is definitely doing that. But, oh, wow. Um, you know, I'm I, I will say, Chris, I am sorry that I missed this movie in 1998 because it was probably very funny then. And I may have found it very funny then, especially sitting in a theater full of people laughing. Uh, But watching it for the first time in 2023 on my own, oh man, Uh, if this is part of the rage that you felt at me making you watch Empire Records, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm genuinely sorry. (laughs) Um, because I am just filled with vitriol over uh, this film. It's, it's not just that. It also is like, I think about, I I wrote it down in my notes. I said, how could I have found this funny at that time? Um, because I remember these scenes, everyone knows about the, the particular scenes. And I just, I looked at them now and I had the opposite reaction to what my memory told me. So, you know, can you just imagine having been the person who loved it at the time and now goes, uh, wait, what? I, who was I, I, then? I only hope, Evan, that um, you get to experience the sheer number of people telling you that um, you're a dumb dumb. Uh, for not liking this movie, as I have gotten to experience uh, from the number of people who now tell me that um, Empire Records is their favorite movie ever, and how could I not get it? Uh, so it's a very interesting <laughs> experience, which I hope you get to share with me now, uh, now that you've had something from the past which you didn't see and now have seen and didn't enjoy it. And I think I think there there is a lot to be said about um, – uh, the nostalgia of movies and the role that plays in our enjoyment of them. Um, and because I'll, I'll, I'll say rewatching this movie, not having seen it in probably um, t- 20 
years or, or something like that. Um, that, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's definitely a lot more stuff where I was uh, cringing uh, through parts of it and feeling uncomfortable uh, watching it. I, I still think there's a few bits where you're like, okay, that's funny. I just wish I could lift that out of the other two hours that is this movie. Um, but, I mean, that that is what it is, right? Like, I, I think one of the interesting things to talk about is whether any um, comedy or even, I mean, I think same, same is true potentially of empire records, you know, a thing that is just a vibe from an era that relies on you kind of being on the in on that, how well that ages, uh, and how well it's relatable to people at, at uh, you know, a later date, if you're not experiencing it at that point in time and kind of part of it and understanding it, how good is it to pick up later? And I think that's where, you know, potentially for both of us, where the struggle lies in those movies, right? Um, well, uh, I think that's maybe a, a good spot to take a break. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we can poke at Evan and make him angry. Oh, hey, welcome back. So we're going to get into everything about something about Mary, uh, spoiling as much of it as we can. Uh, so for those of you who don't know or don't remember or just like to hear me talk about plots, uh, this movie follows a man named Ted uh, who uh, hires a shady a private investigator to track down his high school sweetheart uh things get complicated for ted though as healy and an ever-growing number of men reveal their true feelings for mary so this movie revolves around mary who is played by cameron diaz the it girl of the late 90s how well do you think she lands in that kind of role uh in this film Oh, amazingly well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, she's objectively, she's a beautiful person and she is written. I mean, the, the thing she she's written to be so idealized, you know, she's so sweet and smart and kind and funny and, uh, you know, also like loves sports and uh, just wants to eat barbecue and uh really likes to wear uh button-up shirts that are way too tight across her chest uh and also not wear a bra a lot and you know it's it's mary is so very much a a <laughs> uh, an ideal woman written by men I, I i it's interesting because i found and again this kind of goes back to if you think about it where it was at the time i don't think she fell into the uh the character didn't fall into the um manic pixie dream girl that we might see in other ones because she actually has a real job uh and she is genuine in a lot of ways she likes the things she likes and that's okay it just i think that's part of what it's intended to be that it becomes this like um you know fish hook with bait on it for all these creepy creepy dudes uh and that yucky male gaze that you kind of experience throughout the movie but i will say i think sometimes very very literally like where matt dillon is just holding up binoculars yeah. and and staring at her undressing. but i will say cameron diaz in this role i think is great and i think it's very easy yeah, she's yeah delightful. it's very easy to see why she becomes the anchor of this movie because i i think she plays uh whether the 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 character itself is a little uh weird or not like she plays those beats perfectly she's likable she's entertaining she's intelligent I think you're both right because the, the of course the character is like ridiculously perfect, but Chris is also right to say that it's not the type of character you would have come across in these standard movies. So, you know, points for that. And also she's so infectious, like the all the laughters and the jokes and um 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 you know, just effing with you, like all of that is just brilliant. It's so believable. She's definitely one of the highlights of this movie. Yeah, I, I definitely think she is. And then that kind of ties us into the other two uh, leading roles in this. So Matt Dillon and uh, Ben Stiller. Um, like what what about those two characters and those two actors in, in this movie? I am like I, Matt Dillon leans all the way in into sort of like scumbag 
PI and and I thought he did a really good job of that. And Ben Stiller, you know, the one kind of half decent dude, I guess, in this movie question mark. Um yeah, I mean there are there I, I do have a lot of quibbles in terms of uh the way that um this film goes from being kind of just a very earnest film to then feeling like, uh, oh, okay, here we are going to do our comedic set piece. And um, that comedic set piece is going to feel like it's on Saturday Night Live and we're kind of going to shoot it the same way. And then we're going to go back to it feeling kind of like, a romantic comedy movie. And now we're going to have a set piece where, again, it feels like it's for a sketch show rather than sort of even the language of, of the film that we're setting up in between. And because of that, I felt that some of the performance performances got um, kind of, kind of jagged that, that it felt sometimes like the, the people were in two different movies. Uh, I agree. And that, the, the whole separation of the characters themselves versus the acting, it's really hard to to, to kind of like keep those yes, in is, mind yeah. at the same time. Because I think that absolutely what you said about uh, Matt Dillon, the fact that he leans into it so much, I just, I think that's brilliant. The character is the most ridiculous character ever and does the most ridiculous things. Um, and then the flip of that, then, then you have um, then you have Keith David uh, when, when Ted comes to meet the parents, who is like such a fun interesting different character but then like you say then you, now we have to put him in this scene that we've decided we're going to do and then he's got the most ridiculous thing around hey come and have a look at this come and have a look at this come and have a look at this and it just it's so inconsistent and, uh, all over the place uh, but i think that definitely what you said about the acting for those two i think is pretty good ted's character i have a lot of issues with because it's all over the place at least matillon is consistent even though it's the worst. Yeah, I, I I will say that I, I actually find Ben Stiller in this movie. I remembered liking him more in the past than rewatching it. I'm like, I don't like, I don't like Ted. Like he's he's such a, a, a throwaway, yucky, leftover character. It's hard to like be like, I want Ted to win. And again, that's probably the passage of time where you're like, it's really creepy what you're doing, man. Like this is w- weird and you're stalkerish and not an okay thing to be thinking about in 2023. Um, I will say it was interesting uh, as I was seeing some of the like, casting close calls uh, for that role because for Ben Stiller, this was one of his first real acting roles. He'd been doing some directing and stuff before that. Uh, I mean, Reality Bites stands out as a movie that he'd been in prior to this, but this is one of his first kind of like big leading uh, comedic roles, obviously goes on to do a whole bunch of uh, other stuff, including, you know, um, um, Zoolander and some other stuff not too long after this, but some other yeah, but like Meet the Parents, which I think is maybe the highest grossing comedy yeah, of all time, it's, potentially. It's, uh, the Hangover movies are up there above it and some others as well. Oh, they but yeah, are, it's yeah. definitely up there as well. Um, but like, yeah, this was nearly uh, Owen Wilson or Jon Stewart as Ted in this movie, which I think could have been interesting. Uh, I could especially have seen Owen Wilson in this role back in, you know, 1998. That feels just about right. I'd be curious what you you'd think if it was somebody else who'd been in that Ted role. I don't know. I mean, oh, is I, I think I think Ben Stiller is uh you know, a a great comedic actor. Um and uh you know shout out to uh, to a fellow uh, uh Irish Jewish heritage guy. Um Owen Wilson yeah, maybe maybe too handsome for the role. Not that Ben Stiller's a bad looking dude, but like Owen Wilson, maybe too handsome for for this role. Like you you kind of want, uh, you know, if if you've got somebody that good looking as the Ted character, like how much more good looking does Mary have to be? You know, the, like it feels like there there needs to be that that dichotomy. I don't know that I could have. I'm sure that they would have put Owen Wilson in great teenage makeup, but Ben Stiller with the 
you know, the mullet and the acne and the braces. Uh, I, I don't see Owen Wilson carrying that off as well. No, I think Ben Stiller in this was, he did a, an amazing job. I think that so many of the people in this movie, they were limited by the script and what the characters are supposed to be in that moment. But I think he did a terrific job leaning into that. Like, it's all very funny. It's just, it makes no sense his journey, what he goes through and how he has to act so different in different times. But whenever he's asked to step up to the plate, I think he does a, a great job. Yeah, I think uh, he does a pretty good job in this movie too. I just, I, I don't love the character of Ted uh, more than I think uh, I have issues with Ben Stiller. Um, and I, yeah. I, I think for me, that kind of ties it into, I mean, you're already poking at it, Evan, is like the, the narrative arc of this story. I, I will say one of the things for me is I find most comedies are really just set up as a bunch of funny bits. And then we have to find just enough, you know, narrative rope to connect all of them. You know, I, I wouldn't say that's dissimilar from a uh, 40 year old virgin or, you know, any Seth Rogen movie or whatever. There's just certain bits that I think they, they create and then connect the dots on how to get to maybe not as well crafted stories. Maybe they do a better job of it, you know, 10 or 15 years later, but how much does that narrative arc kind of feel like a bumpy roller coaster ride for each of you as you watch through this movie? It's a good question. I actually think when you mention it like that, I think you're right. Like someone thought about the structure. Someone thought about stuff like here's the thing that happened in the past. Past now, I'm going to look up Mary. I find out these things, and then and you tell that simultaneous story of what's going on with the Dylan character. And then the, the trip down to Florida and the things that happen there, like they, someone thought about the structure and then kind of said, oh, what could we throw in here to make it funny? But I actually think the structure is there. Now, how I felt it watching it, I, I, I don't think that it worked. It just, it was all over the place. But I do think that there's a structure and maybe like you say, more so in some, some other movies uh, that have been very popular since. Yeah, you know... The the one of the things that I had a lot of difficulty with in this movie was you know you know that that it is a comedy and it is ostensibly I mean it's a comedy without jokes like there are, there is no there are no jokes in this movie really it is it is very and 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 i think that maybe this is a deliberate thing but it is so earnest and and sort of very kind of sweet up until those points that you have these these comedic set pieces that it's usually um supposed to be very shocking. He's got his dick stuck in the zipper or Matt Dillon thinks he's going to be looking at uh, Cameron Diaz's boobs, but it's the old lady's boobs and, you know, or it's the dog has, uh, you know, gone into a coma and Matt Dillon is trying to revive it with uh, with the the uh, lamp wires. It just it, it felt like um the the directors were very deliberately going okay we're going to have this very sort of earnest kind of thing so that when we then show uh, a dick stuck in the zippers or a pair of withered boobs or a cute dog being vicious and biting somebody on the crotch that that's going to be so juxtaposed it's already like whoa, this is already beyond the pale for 1998, but it's going to be like crazy because the audience will be expecting this and then we're going to give them this. And that it just did not land with me. It's it the, the, the space between the comedic set pieces, which I don't think hold up, period anyway, is so long and drags so much and is so unfunny that it just made me sad and angry. Yeah, and you Don't know, I, it's so <laughs> interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting you say that about the uh, comedy without jokes because the literally the one uh, laugh out loud moment I had was when he picks up the hitchhiker and they're having this conversation about the uh, seven minute workout, and then he suggests six, and he just has this reaction like, "What do you mean?" What do you mean six? Now six could never work. And that that moment was so funny to me. 
It's not really a joke. It's just the absurdity of it. And I could sort of like imagine a movie that pulled that off more, where you had these things that aren't, you know, not an obvious setup for, for a joke. They're just weird connecting all these things that you said. What a different movie it could have yeah, been. Yeah, I don't have to imagine that movie because it was made and it's called Anchorman. Like it's, you know, like it, to, to Chris's point, like this you know, this movie, like when we talked about Enter the Dragon, like this movie has a, a probably a very much an outsized footprint for what it did to the movie, you know, itself. It's like, okay, if this movie really helped launch, uh, you know, the, the, the comedy conversation forward in filmmaking and we get, you know, the Judd Apatow stuff and the um, uh, point being is that uh, I hate this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think part of this goes back to uh, it, there's a bit of a struggle in the connect the dot scenes, which, again, I would go back to that's true of almost every comedy I ever watch. You know, you just referenced, uh, you know, um, uh, Anchorman and whatever, you know, a, a bunch of those other movies that would follow in, in the early 2000s. And I struggle with the same thing. There's funny lines. I don't necessarily love the movies, especially going back and watching them now. Um, but I think one of the things that is perhaps even that much more divisive, uh, if we were to um, hand this to our, um, you know, Gen Z uh, test group, uh, let's call them uh, Zane and Skylar. And we said, hey, Zane and Skylar, do you want to go watch this movie? Uh, like, how high on the offended, uh, the offendo meter do you think Zane and Skylar would come back uh, and say this movie was? I don't know that they would be like, oh, my God, it's so offensive. I think they might be more along my lines and be like, this movie's not funny. And it, it just like, really? Like, this is this is what had it, this is what comedy was in the late 90s. Oof. No wonder you Gen Xers fucking suck. I, I actually agree. I think that is a, the biggest crime that this one has. Yes, it is highly offensive. Yes, it's got stereotypes that you could not do today. But the biggest offense is that it's just not funny now. I think I, I object more to that than the, than the stereotypes themselves, although I object to that too. But, but, but I, I still would like to run that as a social experiment to see what would people say. Um, because I have no idea, like such a different perspective, the combination of having watched it at the time versus coming in fresh now and having grown up in a different era. Like it's, it's all factors uh, that kind of go into this. Yeah, it is. It is. It is an interesting one because the Fairley brothers, when they wrote this, uh, I mean, so, a number of things in this movie are based off of real life. So the, the, uh, junk caught in a zipper was actually based on a real life thing that happened to one of their friends and the dad who was a doctor had to go in and sort it out. It didn't get as dramatic as what happens in the movie, but it's a real thing. Um, their next door neighbor was a guy with a intellectual disability named Warren who actually appears in the movie. So, I mean, they're basing a lot of this off of real stuff and it feels like for 1998, they were touching on a lot of those subjects in a way that was probably um, funny, but thoughtful for 1998 not so much for 2023. Uh, so I think there's a sense of like um, honesty and thoughtfulness that probably felt pretty good at the time, but mm, not always great now. I don't think so. I, I don't know. How do we, how do we get that group going? Well, you know, I, I think that, that you're right there, Chris. And, and it's one of the things that I do like that the Fairley brothers, you know, we're, we're using actors with disabilities. What I didn't like, and, and again, this is 1998 is a different time. So you're not going to go for the authenticity of, you know, really having a, you know, a, a character who actually has crutches like that, uh, you know, or, um, and granted Tucker, the character of Tucker, uh, is actually faking his injuries, but you know he goes full Jerry Lewis on those Boy, crutches yeah. at, at one point, and it it really does feel like a lot of that comedy ends up kind of punching down. And yeah. uh, it would be funnier if you knew in he, advance that he was like faking it, as opposed to finding out yeah. after where they're just playing it for laughs because look at him wobble. 
Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, character of Warren. So W Earl Brown, um, I think he does it, does a good job of, of playing that part. But uh, again, you know, it, it feels like that part is, you know, they, that, that they're, they're punching down a bit. There is there, it is done with love and you can kind of tell that, but it just still doesn't feel great by today's that's exactly standards. it. I think I think w- the standard for where it was in '98 was beyond where most movies were able to get to, and the standard for 2023 yeah. is it's behind where most movies are able to get to. Yeah, totally agree. And I think I think one of the other things that hasn't aged that well about this movie in terms of uh, the story and the plot, and we've already kind of touched on it, but like this is a creepy movie. This is about a, oh, a bunch a of dudes movie. who have turned this one kind of delightful, <sighs> wonderful woman into like a, a fetish, uh, into an object of their weird, weird behaviors. Uh, and like, I again, a thing that I don't think holds up as well uh, in 2023, like just a sense of stalkery, creepy, weird shoe stealing creepiness well also there's that sense of not just the the stalker ring stalking stalking but uh the level of male entitlement in it is really off-putting in 2023 you know it's that kind of thing where you know at the end where they're like well mary you need to pick you need to like you need to pick one of us because obviously it's got to be one of us you need to you need to pick one of us and we're demanding that you pick one of us and it's that sense of just that yeah that that entitlement is so gross looking back on it now, uh, I'm sh- I'm sure that people didn't think much about it in 1998. I'm glad we've gotten to a point uh, 25 years later where uh, maybe people are. Well, I I yeah I I agree with you on that, and I think one of the things about that kind of um, you know uh, demanding imposing uh, male questions is even how this movie ends. But maybe it's time to take a quick break and we can talk about the ending of this movie uh, quickly on the other side. We'll be right back. Welcome back. So I think one of the interesting things about this movie is indeed how it ends where Mary is confronted by uh, a whole swarm of uh, weird, creepy uh, b- dudes, Brett Favre, uh, who seems to be fine, uh, and uh, Ben Stiller characters, who, who is, I don't know, maybe the second least creepy out of those. Is it like would this movie have wrapped up better if she just was like. I'm just going to burn this place down and run away from all of you uh, rather than actually picking somebody, Ted, in this case, um, out of that bunch of creepos. I mean, it's probably what made would have made the most amount of sense were she uh, uh, an actual person. But it's a romantic comedy. Right. And so you've got to get that. uh that nice little bit at the end and, and then shoot one of the musicians. Yeah. And I think also that would only have worked if this was uh, Mary's amazing adventure, but it was Ted's amazing journey. Like that's, it's his story. So if she had done that at the end, it, it would have broken that arc all of a sudden, like we're now going to care for her and she's the heroes. Like I, I think that wouldn't have worked, although that could have been a much better. Movie. I think it could have too. I think there's something about Mary from Mary's perspective could have been, uh, either either it could have been a much funnier movie or it could have been an updated version of Vertigo. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a horror yeah, movie. Yeah. I, I mean, as you find out, all the men in your life are actually plotting against you. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I think the one thing about this movie, too, that that I found interesting is, uh, and not surprisingly, with the Farley brother, Farley brothers and um, uh, their, their writing, you know, this this movie is half written. You know, we've got the the big set scenes and the key things to get out of it, but also kind of half improvised, which sets up a number of the the folks in the movie to do um, some interesting and entertaining 
stuff, right? There are there are some performances here, um, you know, little ones that are that are kind of entertaining. You've got Richard Jenkins as as um, Ben Stiller's therapist, and Jeffrey Tambor as uh, Matt Dillon's. Uh, compatriot in in Miami and uh, Harlan Williams is the as the hitchhiker um and and yeah I guess they're doing some fun stuff with the improv maybe that's also kind of why everything feels so flat in between the big comedic set pieces because it's hard to improv and you know they're they're just not going for big jokes I don't know I I, I just I, I don't care about any of these characters. But but also the, the people that you listed and, and there's uh, Sarah Silverman on top of that. Oh, like right. there's, they, they're so underused. They could be so good at this because that's what they do. And, and we've seen them all in, in some terrific performances. So you just go like, where they downplay it so much that it's so incredibly funny. Yet here it's just like, you, you're giving them nothing to work with or you're letting them speak for 15 seconds. So it's kind of like, Again, like I think that's more the issue than, than so much of the other stuff. Yeah, I will. I will say that I already found this movie was too long at two hours, so I didn't really need more of anybody else. I kind of actually needed a little bit less, and for this to be a little bit of a tighter story and uh, a little bit shorter movie. But uh, yeah, that's that's definitely the case uh, for me. I think one of the things too that is a little bit weird about this movie uh is those musicians who pop in throughout yeah i mean let's talk about those musicians and the music choices um because first off like okay i think we can all agree that paddington did like this conceit way better than there's something about mary something about mary did it first but paddington perfected it and also uh did anyone else find like the lip sync and the drum sync of the, the sync of the musicians like a bunch yeah way yeah. off like no, like it, way was, off. it was it was painfully off and also i think because they knew that they were doing it that way the singer guitar player he completely overdid his his gestures but i i actually thought it was a pretty clever thing to introduce uh it's like you say, it was first. And then I agree with you about Paddington, but by ways of Flight of the Concords, because they kind of also would do that where they're just breaking into sort of a singing number and then it's just completely normal and they go back to to whatever. Um, so I'm, I, it was one of those things that didn't make any sense. I'm kind of glad it was there. Yeah, I had issues with the syncing, but again, on a relative basis, they were probably pretty good compared to everything else going on. I don't know, but uh, what know. does it add to the story? Like, what does what does it, aside from being, you know, sort of a little bit of, I guess, some narrative tissue, uh, what does having, like, fourth wall breaking musicians help? I, I don't like, know. What I, does I just, having fourth wall breaking record store employees help? Yeah, no, touche. I'm just saying, man. Touche. <laughs> and, and not... And not to mention, so like, so we already mentioned, you know, Flight of the Concords, Paddington, Rango does this um, with the uh, with the band that speaks directly to the camera, you know, about the hero will uh, ultimately die. And it's just all of this. Uh, it works. It's just these guys were the first ones. Applaud, applaud them for that. It wasn't very successful, but it set the stage, paved the, the road, et cetera, et cetera, for all these other things. To, Rango to is a deep cut there michael that is a deep, like, deep cut. <laughs> wow but it, you know and speaking of the music itself did anyone else find the music choices odd i i i'm not sure how much i loved uh using brazil for the the dog sort of uh uh, uh shocking scene or like summertime for throwing the the speed filled dog biscuits up into the apartment. It just, it, it just seemed kind of, I don't know, weird and wacky and wacky in, in a, a, a tonally, a tonally different way. I, I think it's one of those other things that made me feel like 
these comedic set pieces were very much like of another movie than the connective tissue. I also think it's funny because I'm, I'm about to give a reference now that is such an illustration of this with nostalgia because one of the tracks in here was from Lloyd Cole, who's a British uh, musician. And he's always done this very sort of nostalgic uh, US Route 66 type of music. And that is in a way ridiculous. But because I grew up with that at that time, that really strikes a, a nerve for me. And I was like, oh, wow, this is such a good track. And then I'm sold on that. This makes sense. It doesn't matter if it makes sense or not in the context, but it just, I like it because I was there when it happened. I grew up with it. So, you know, like it's, it's a, a, an element sort of a, a showing how nostalgia and being there at the time really makes a difference in, in the enjoyment. Yeah. I, I, fa- I find it, it to be an interesting question because I just, I, I didn't really notice the music. I didn't find it jarring or disruptive or, out of, but it just was, I was fine with it. I didn't like, no, not, not a bonus for like awesome choices or anything, but I also didn't find it jarring or out of place. I did find the musicians a bit weird, especially when they were regularly out of sync and not playing the instruments as the instruments were being played. And like that kind of stuff was definitely a little off. Like there's a drum sound, but the drummer isn't drumming. Okay. That's weird. Uh, But you kind of pointed at it uh, there, Evan is like, I think the the one thing that we do have to talk about um, in this movie is those set pieces, right? The the way Roger Ebert described it was uh, uh, there's something about Mary is an unalloyed exercise in bad taste and contains five or six explosively funny sequences. How do you feel about those five or six explosively funny sequences? How about we start with Michael? Cause uh, I know Evan is going to hate them. So Michael, how did you feel about the five or six? I hated them. <laughs> the, I, I had a, such a strong memory of loving them. So I was a bit looking forward to each of them kind of coming up because I, I knew they were coming and instead it just had like a big groan thing. Um, and, and it was very hard for me because like I said, I had to reconcile this idea that, you know, I, was a person who loved everything about this. And now I'm like, I, I, I don't see it. I don't, I don't recognize it. So no, I, I did not, like I thought they were terrible, all of them. Everything from the hook to the scrotum to the uh, hair gel to the wrestling the dog, like it's just dumb. Resuscitating the, the dog with you know electrical cables. It's just idiotic. So uh, I'm with Michael, but I will bring uh, some positivity to this. Uh, I thought that um, the execution of the physical comedy in this, and and we have to say that like this is, like these comedic set pieces are straight up slapstick. Absolutely. And and I think that that as slapstick uh, at that time, they're like, they are, they are well executed. The, the, the physical comedy is very well executed. And that makes me wonder then if that's part of the, sort of the secret sauce of this film's success is that it was very transgressive at the time. So that makes for funny things, but that kind of lack of actual like language jokes, um, but really big physical comedy then translates very, very, very well internationally. You know, I'm I'm sure that that uh, Ben Stiller getting uh, bitten in the crotch by a small dog was was being laughed at in theaters around the world, no matter what language anybody spoke. And so that I think was that I think is is an impressive feat. All of that said. I don't think any of that translates particularly well now. And I was not laughing during any of those parts. That's fascinating. I, I, I mean, I, I didn't uh, love revisiting this movie, but I'm definitely the outlier here where I was like, look, again, you know, nostalgia and whatever. A few of those uh, set comedy, um, you know, bits uh, were still funny to me. Like, I still enjoyed those. I don't love... Uh, 80% of the movie was kind of waiting for the big scenes to get back to like, kind of like you were saying, Michael, like, I know, I know what's coming next. I kind of remember what goes, goes in here. Um, So I still love, like, I still, I think there's a certain sense of like, 
where everybody gets a little squirmy at the idea of zipping your junk up in your zipper, uh, whether you love, I'm like, okay, I remember how much I loved this when I was, you know, 20 years old or whatever, watching this, like, okay, yeah, there's still a little bit of something there for me. Uh, the part that makes me laugh out loud when they're going to put him in the ambulance and the, uh, uh, the stretcher actually like collapses and like smashes him into the ground. That wasn't even supposed to be in there. That was an accident that actually happened while they were, um, like filming it and like they just carried on with them like okay there's still stuff that makes me laugh about that um yeah i mean i i think some of these are uh less successful now i don't love all of them but there's definitely a few things in there which um still gave me uh some 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 chuckles and did did entertain me but yeah i i, I can definitely hear what you're saying about part of the reason why this did succeed is like i think everybody felt that like ouchy cringy moment zipping up your junk i think everybody would get that wherever wherever you are in the world without having to worry about subtitles or whatever which are, don't convey comedy in the same way so it's easy to see how, how this thing gets going and i think in the same way that later on you've got like the hangover uh where a lot of the the humor is just like these over-the-top situations which would translate regardless of of language barriers so this has been really interesting chris because i feel like me watching this movie was like you watching the Enter the Dragon and Empire Records, um, where you know the you didn't love the fight sequences in Enter the Dragon anymore, but appreciated what they were at the time. So look, going into this, we we kind of said you know half jokingly, but pretty seriously. We're gonna to try to find uh, something kind of positive and everything we do. So, like for each of you, what 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 would you say? I mean, for positivity, I I think that that there's some really well executed slapstick here, and uh, like uh, Enter the Dragon was for like martial arts. Maybe this was for comedy. Um, and it, it sort of launches the things that I like, but I'm not super into the source material, I guess, if that makes sense. Like for me, I think you really have to respect. And it's so funny that you, that you mentioned Anchorman because you can really kind of trace the lineage and you can just admire the importance a move like this had in terms of Staking out new ground and showing what's possible, I think that is hugely important in any genre, any any field. But I also think, like in terms of the the actors that were in it and what they've been able to do and the the, the recognition they got, like I think that's that's really really good. I just didn't care for coming back to like I didn't enjoy it now the way I did then. So for me, I think I probably feel a little bit of you know loss around that. But I think it is well worth kind of calling out especially if you're studying this stuff and you're interested in the evolution to go back and look at it just from, from that perspective. Yeah. I, I feel, um, exactly like that where I, I, I think this was a pretty, um, seminal movie in the development of kind of what we see as North American comedies that have evolved over the no last pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is now I want to take credit for that. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely where it's headed in the same way that, you know, um, the Sopranos laid the framework for a lot of, you know, TV dramas uh, and HBO shows and whatever that have come since the the format and the pacing and the structure and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I know lots of people who go back and watch The Sopranos for the first time are like, uh, I don't know. I don't love it. It's not as good as all these other shows that came after. Well, yeah. Right. I mean, those shows came after for, for a reason. Right. Um, so, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit of a mixed bag. Like I still found there was moments I didn't, uh, hate rewatching this movie, uh, from my youth, but I also didn't love it. This isn't my warm and cozy and fuzzy, uh, comedy blanket. Like I think it, uh, uh, Empire Records was for for Evan, uh, but this is a movie I did watch a whole bunch uh, back in the day, and I was very curious how it would stand up, especially understanding um, kind of what what followed over the next kind of twenty five years after this this came out. But yeah, definitely uh, not in love with it now. Um, so I mean, I guess that brings us to uh, a question for for each of you before we wrap up here uh, for the folks who haven't seen this movie who have missed out on it. 
till today. Uh, I, I'm guessing I know your answers, but is this a movie that you think folks uh, who have missed it should go back and watch, or is this something they should just miss? No, no, go, go, go spend your time doing something better. Don't, 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 unless, unless you are a student of comedy and you are trying to see uh, a, a specific evolution of comedic filmmaking in American cinema. Uh, yeah, sure. Then, but oh man, just don't, don't waste your time. I, I couldn't recommend it to anyone either, unless for that reason, um, like it just, it's exactly like it said, there, there are other movies out there to watch unless someone said, you know, you, we should watch this together for these reasons. And I'm going to tell you what they are before. And I'm going to explain like, Sure, but no, I, I couldn't recommend this. Yeah, I'm one. I'm there with both of you too. If this is a movie that you haven't seen and didn't grow up with, uh, it probably uh, isn't one that you need to go back to. I think there's better Ben Stiller movies. Uh, I think there's better comedies that probably followed in the the years that followed uh, this that are you know better and funnier and uh, hold up a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, this is probably one that was worth uh, skipping. So there you go. Uh, that's what we thought about. There's something about Mary. Uh, we'd love to know what you thought about this movie and whether you are as angry at me as Evan is. Uh, you can find us on Twitter and send me your hate mail there at How Did You Miss This? That's HDYMT underscore pod. And while you're there, take a look at some of the other movies we're planning on watching soon and send us any questions you might have and whether you're going to fire bomb my house. Uh, if you enjoy what we're doing here, take a second to rate, review, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening and we're going to be back next week when we'll be watching Michael's movie Jacob's Ladder to see if we can unravel the mystery in that movie or whether it's a movie that should stay missed thanks for listening and we'll talk to you then